Friends Podcast. Okay, here we are again. It is July, Monday, July the 22nd, 2019. This is episode six of our Artist Friends Podcast. And this is Clyde J. Kale. I'm here again with uh, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. And hi, everybody. Hi. This is Diane Hunt. <laughs> hi, this is Constance Bronson. All right, <laughs> we're off to a good start here. Diane uh, got her computer problems uh, solved. You know, last week she had a computer crash. I guess our prayers came through to her. Uh, we started out; she had a little bit of sound difficulty, but we seemed like we got that resolved. And the recommended videos for this week was one was a video by a, a Dr. Atkins on uh, being an artist and is lonely. And some very interesting uh, talks. And I'm doing something a little bit different. I took some audio clips and we're going to play a little bit of the audio clip and then discuss that. And uh, the second video was an excellent video by Stephen Bauman and one of his very recent one that was published on uh, July the 18th and it is an excellent video with uh, how to become a master marketer uh, of your art and the same deal what we're going to do we'll probably end up end up this would be a two-parter podcast it would be uh, recorded today but then we'll publish it in two separate parts otherwise I think it would be an hour-long podcast <laughs> That would be a little too much. So we'll uh, publish in uh, part one and part two. Let me start the screen, the share screen up here. And we will start out with playing the first audio clip from uh, Dr. Atkins on uh, being an artist is lonely. And he talks a little bit about the pressure uh, encourages creativity. Going back to Philip Roth again, seeing Did you hear that? with him yes. the later years of his life, he had moved from New York City to sort of the Connecticut woods to be left alone. And all of the journalists said, isn't it lonely here for you? And he said, it is, but I enjoy it. There's no, there's no friction. There's nothing because I guess, he, I guess it was after Portnoy's complaint or one of the, he was just receiving so much attention and he was bombarded with people's opinions. And this was just an easier way for him to continue. And I know this is a, a common thing you know, of, of sort of taking yourself off the map so that you can create, but the loneliness was worth it versus the friction. Yeah, and obviously it worked for him because uh, other people who would go off to live in the woods end up not being productive because they, they think that's going to solve their problem. I mean, I, I learned this the hard way because I had to finish a, a book early in my academic career and I decided I'd go to my parents' lake cottage and just sit there and finish it and of course I almost got nothing done that summer because one thing led to the other people would stop by to visit because it was the lake and you know the lawn would need attending or the cabin itself needed fixing and I used every excuse I could possibly think of to avoid sitting down to write uh, this is where I worked out a lot of the the theories that are in, in my view of creativity is that summer because Pressure is what causes creativity to work best. Lack of pressure actually works against creativity. Okay. Comments. What do you what do you two think about that? I agree with what he says as far as the pressure. I always work better when I was under pressure. Um, I still do, I guess. But a lot of like now, I I put the pressure on myself more so. Like when I was in college, we had deadlines and even other jobs I've had, we had deadlines that we had to get stuff done by. And it seemed like that last day before the deadline time was up, you did a lot more and, and you got a lot more done. Um, but and it, it does, um, 
increase your creativity, I think. I, I understand now why you, uh, when we first started meeting, you recommended that we set up some kind of a goal or mm-hmm. task, you know, for ourselves. And uh, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think that uh, in my, my own case of uh, getting ready for our Monday meetings, you know, I, I go through and I, Early in the week, I have in my mind videos that I watch. I say, okay, that, yeah, those would be good. But then I've got it at the last minute. i got to hurry up and get the email sent out to let you know what were, you know, the recommendation videos and and now preparing the podcast, you know. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, having a uh, some friction and some uh, goals and uh, some pressures, it does help in the creativity. What about you, Constance? You do you agree with that or I do I really do um I find that for the art shows um I haven't scheduled any art shows but I don't like to do art shows in the summertime because it's so hot and I don't do well in the heat but I haven't set anything up yet so far for winter or fall but I want to find out first if it's going to be a hot fall or a mild (laughs) fall or whatever but I do need to go ahead and set up the shows for the winter shows. And um, I am sort of working towards getting geared up for that now. But I haven't, I haven't done any pre-work for the shows. And um, I need to go ahead and get started on that. So, yeah, all of the stuff that I sold, I haven't replaced yet. Okay. Uh, Let's uh, listen to the next clip. It's about a two-minute clip, and he talks about the Type C personality. And I remember, before we got started, Constance, you said you wasn't sure about that. Well, I'll let you listen to this, and then we'll, we'll uh, try to expand on it. Okay. All right. So you talked about the Type C personality, and then in your book, How to Escape Lifetime Security and Pursue Your Impossible Dream, A Guide to Transforming Your Career, is it Chapter 6, A Day in the Life of Type C? And I was wondering if we could talk about that. How, how is that day in the life? Is it a structured day? Is it? Well, it, it it's different from, uh, you know, it's going to be different for every type C. And it's going to be different from, uh, from people who are not type Cs. <laughs> and how it's different is that the type C is, has learned uh, how to arrange his day to fit his type, to fit his mind. Uh, to fit his or her mind. Some people are night owls and some people are, you know, early birds. And the early bird writer is not going to write late at night because she's not comfortable writing late at night. She's comfortable in the morning. So if she gets up at four o'clock, she's going to give herself um, as much time as she has attention span for to do her writing in the morning which is when I love to do mine because no one interrupts you from four to seven in the morning. Uh, but if you're a night owl, as Tolkien was, he wrote Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. after one o'clock at night because he, he was so busy all the time before then and had a family and everything else. So he wrote in the middle of the night. And uh, sometimes he wrote all night and, and just went to, you know, went off to school uh, to teach without any sleep at all. But that was okay because he was doing what he loved. So his his day would be arranged differently than, you know, the day of someone who's on a clock. It's not their clock. Somebody who has to show up for a nine o'clock job is not on their own clock. And their day is going to be probably one that they're upset with most of the time. Whereas if you're, um, you know, if you're type C and you're in charge of your own life, you're going to re- arrange it around patterns that work best for your mind. And that I think that's a crucial part of becoming a type C is having your own kind of day. Okay. So I think uh, the three of us, we can agree that we're probably type C's. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> you understand that, what he's talking about now, Constance? Yeah, I do. Most yeah. definitely. Yeah, because later on, I didn't – I didn't. Uh, Make, uh, make the clip, but he went on and expanded about that a little bit later on in the in the video that uh, talking about the continent and the islands and basically the continent is like where the normal people who 
work nine to five jobs, live, you know, but he said the artist is, is, is on a continent and everything is wonderful in our little world, but then the people are, are the artists on the islands, but the people on the continent think the, the people on the islands are nuts, you know, <laughs> are, are weird, you know, and, and he told us, <laughs> you know, and, and he said, eventually what happens is, is the, the people that are on the islands, uh, they use and they fulfill some of the desires of the continent. And that's, and so when they're, and they're recognized and they eventually win over and then they become, when they, when is it jumping forward, when an artist is recognized and, and famous, then they actually become part of the continent too. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and this goes in line with this Type C conversation. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I didn't record it because it, it was really, really long when he went off. You know? I yeah. I think that's what got you confused, Constance, when you said you wasn't sure what he was talking about because it's a very, uh, oh, what's the word I want to use? Very brainy, brainiac, very, you know, cerebral <laughs> the way he. Well, I understood what he was talking about, about all of that, but then I, I just really, I guess I didn't get the first part of it when he was talking about the type C personality. I understood. Uh, I guess I thought it was two different conversations, what he was having, you know. And uh, he, he almost does that. If you don't follow along real close, you can get lost. He's very cerebral. Yeah. A very, you know, and I've never heard this guy before, and I just, it was one of the recommended videos. That, you know. I'm definitely a type C personality, because if I had my druthers, I would, I'm on a day shift schedule right now, and I'd, I really hate it. I would rather be <laughs> the person who was up at, during the night. I'm a night owl, and I like it when I'm a night owl. I used to work in a factory at night, and I loved it, you know, and come home eat breakfast and go to bed and, <laughs> and I do <laughs> and I liked it you yeah. know and uh when the world my world was upside down and I avoided the world you know and I still like to do that here in the studio when I can have it you know because I avoid the outside world but then the outside world says hey you have to go to the doctor at a certain time you have to go do this at a certain time you have, and then I have to turn my world back right side up in order to get these things done. You know, so right now I am waiting for this eye stuff to be done because as soon as it's done, I'm turning my world upside down again <laughs> so that I can be asleep when it's 90-something degrees outside and then be outside and take care of the chickens and do everything in the morning when it's nice and cool and pretty outside. Because see, right now it's so hot outside. Yeah, I don't know how people do it. It's a hot you know? <laughs> yeah. What I want to be out when the sun comes up. I want to be ready and go out and paint <laughs> when it's <laughs> nice outside. Diane, what, what are your What are your thoughts on on this Type C conversation? I, I think what it all boils down to is you really have to know yourself and mm -hmm. how <clears throat> how best you work and um, just go with that. I mean. I'm kind of a night person too, but in order to do like plein air painting, which I love to do, I have to be a day daytime person because you can't see too much at night. I mean, you can do some nocturnes, but you know, it's limited like you know what you can see. So it kind of forces you to to do something else. But um, and I like I love to work in natural light, so. You know, nighttime, the lighting, unless you have the, you know, the, the bulbs that give you the sun, real sunlight effect, it's hard to work at night and get your true colors and stuff. So, I mean, you have to kind of know how you best work and how the work that you want to do is done best, too. Like, so I have to kind of work back and forth in different Sometimes I work at night and sometimes I work during the day. It just depends yeah. on what I'm doing. Exactly. It's, it's kind of like yeah. what, you know, so. what he says to uh, mm -hmm. a, a type C person arranges the schedule to them. Yeah. You have to know yourself. Yeah. You have mm -hmm. to know what, be, what works best for you and not, uh, you know, uh, pay attention to the other 
people, which is a good segue into the, the last clip, which is about nine minutes long, but it's really good. And you, I think you're, uh, you're, you understand why I say it's a segue and some of the stuff that he covers. So let's, let's start that up. I think um, Philip K. Dick loved to write at night and he would stay up all night. And I'm not sure if some of it was maybe chemically, chemically induced, but then when he married another wife, she wanted him to write from nine to five. She, she said, I'm very middle class bourgeois. Well, I like these hours. And so he eventually got his own apartment, which he called the hovel. It was dirty and he felt that he did his best writing when, when he wanted to in this, you know, sort of dirty apartment and it just lent to what he was doing. So it's just interesting how, you know, we, you know we're, we're... The Hubble syndrome is, is interesting <laughs> because I think every creative person can relate to that. Uh, President Obama called his the whole, and it was always a room that had to be found in any house they were in where nothing could be touched. You know, he could do whatever he wanted, and usually there were papers all over the floor and everything like that. It was there that he finished a book or a speech and so on. And the Hubble is the same idea. And I noticed that, you know, I've always been the same way. By the weekend, my office is a complete mess. There are things all over the floor. And, and then by Monday, <laughs> it's all chip shape. And when you think about that, it's nothing but the externalization of the creative process. Because the creative process is making order out of chaos. You know, St. John's Gospel says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. You know, and, and he goes on and talks about the light, let there be light, etc. So when when the artist creates something, he is taking a bunch of little things and creating order out of them. And so the externalized version of that is is living in a messy place and straightening it up when as much as you have to, whenever you have to. And if there's <laughs> Internal force forcing you to straighten it up, <clears throat> then that creative person is not in charge of their own life, and, and they, they. Okay, I was going to pause that just momentarily. So, where's your hovel at, Constance? You're sitting in your hovel, aren't you? I'm sitting in my hovel. Yes, I am. <laughs> and not only that, I do have this hovel, and I have another building that's part of my hovel, also. <laughs> And I'm trying to claim. I'm trying to claim a room in the house. <laughs> what about you, Diane? Where's your hovel at? <laughs> I have two, too. I have an area in my bedroom, and I also have an area out in one of the outbuildings. So <laughs> well, I kind I of spread myself out too. But my small apartment is my hovel. Believe me, I don't dare bring anybody in this apartment because when he said <laughs> things are a mess, it is a mess. But I, I all my artist stuff. It's in this in this corner where I'm. You know, you guys are seeing the video you know, of me. This is my main. This is my studio. This corner. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be ashamed of your hovel. I, I don't got care. My, my what's is here? I got all my my materials within arm's reach. You know, and so that with when, the, yeah. When, when your space is that right, small, you should not be ashamed of your hovel. Yeah, you my, know, when my when my when the inspiration strikes. It's there. I got it. I could jump right up and go right into it. You know? yeah, and I think that's important that you have a place that you can leave stuff out because if you have to put everything away when you're done and then get it this back out. It takes too much time. It takes too much time and you lose your inspiration Inspiration to, to work. Yes. Yeah. 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 It does slow the, all that whole process down and makes it really difficult. You have to be able to just go in there and sit down and start working. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, then you've lost precious time. It's just a lot of trouble. You have to, no, I wouldn't be ashamed if you're hub or clot or your hole well, some, or some whatever you want to call it. Yeah, you know, some people need to be able to do that. Though, to put it, you know, they have to put it because they have little kids or something. Exactly. Yeah, you know, they had, yeah. They, or they're like they're working on their kitchen table and they need it clear for dinner, you know, for the family or something. And so you kind of have to do that. It, you you learn to work with it, but it's it does kind of hinder your processes. Yeah, and it slows everything down. Okay, let's hear the rest of what he has to say. Andy, you, you can always find a way to do it. There's a touching short. Like you said, you can always find a way to do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's the name of it, Two Rooms 16, maybe. <laughs> In any case, it's, it's one of her greatest short stories, and it's about a, a housewife who longed all of her life to have a room of her own. And, uh, and it was because she couldn't, she couldn't be herself in her family and she couldn't do what she wanted to do and she didn't feel free. And uh, I won't tell you how it ends because it's not a fun ending, but it's a very tragic example of what happens if you don't take charge of your own creative life. Um, interestingly enough, Tolkien wrote a very introspective piece called Leaf by Niggle. Uh, strange title, but Niggle was the name of a painter uh, who had this amazing vision of a spectacular forest. And his vision was so clear that he could see every tree in the forest clearly, every animal in the forest, every leaf on every tree in the forest. And because he was so busy, he never got around to painting more than a single leaf. That's the way the story ends up, you know, ends up. And it, it's really Tolkien's agonized argument for why he had to write in the middle of the night, because he determined that he was not going to be niggle. You know, even though he wrote something like 40 books on linguistics and different languages, and of course, Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and many other great works, he felt that he had barely gotten to one tree in the forest, um, and, and only that because he wrote all night. So that, that is a terrible thing to kind of carry around, is the, the belief that you can do amazing things, but you don't have time to do them. And the answer is, that's not right. You do have time. I mean, where did Michelangelo find his time? Where did Leonardo da Vinci find his time? You know, they all had the exact same number of hours that we have. And your job is to take your vision seriously and find those hours to make it happen. Or someone like Alice Munro, who when she first started out was, I guess, raising four children. And she didn't want the other housewives in the neighborhood to know that she was a writer because she thought she would get the weird label, which she ended up getting and she didn't care anyway. But um, I guess when you, you win a Nobel Prize, it doesn't, it takes all that away. But, you know. <laughs> um, but she would do it when the children were napping. And if the other housewives knocked on the door, you know, she would put it all away. She didn't want people to know. But uh, so I, I realize that stigma is probably no longer today. No, it's um, it's still there. Is it? Okay. Yeah, it, it's 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 it originates in people's families, uh, and and it's it's when you, you you announce to your father or your mother that you're going to be a writer or you're going to be a circus clown or you're going to be a dancer or you're going to be an actress, and uh, that is where it starts because they, you know, the, the normal response is, well, "What are you going to do for a living?" And uh, that haunts you. There's another book, one of my books where I talk about learning uh, as you go into the creative. Okay, I'm going to pause this because the next segment that he plays is really important. But I, let's talk a little bit about what, what he just said, especially the, 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 uh, the influence that our families have on us. Constance, you've told us many times that you didn't have much influence or encouragement from, from your parents, you know. I had no, no encouragement from my parents. You know, and, and my step-parents. I mean, so. I, I immediately, uh, when he was brought that up, I thought of you. And, you know, I've been blessed that I had all kinds of encouragement, you know, from, from my family. Not so much as, uh, you know, maybe uh, – my mother wasn't didn't wasn't sure what an artist could do as a career, but the ideal that I could create, she encouraged that. And my grandparents, especially my grand my grandmother, you know, she used to have my uh, my grandfather when he was younger was a truck driver, and so he had these large rolls of uh, the butcher paper, you know, that big white butcher paper they used to have in yeah. the shops, you know. And every time oh, cool. go, every time we would go and visit them. You know, stay with it he would cut off a slice of that paper and put it on the floor and my grandmother had sick old cigar boxes with crayons and pencils oh my gosh how cool is that and my brothers and and she would put us all on the floor and she'd say draw me something i mean and we would spend <laughs> hours you know drawing on that you know that butcher paper and, oh gosh that's the wonderful stuff and then she would cut our individual pictures out and of course put them on the refrigerator you know i mean 
how much encouragement can a, a child, I mean, that is just, I was just so yeah. blessed that I had that kind of encouragement, you know? And well, was, we got coloring books and crayons and things like that. I mean, we got that when we were children and they, we were encouraged to use those and I colored a lot and stuff and he didn't want me to be an artist. He wasn't going to send me to school to be an artist. And when I wanted to be an artist, anyway, we'll get off of that subject, okay. but still, <laughs> that's one of the reasons. I know Diane, you've uh, told stories about how, you know, your mother, you know, encouraged you gave you a bucket of water and said go out and paint the i know How, <laughs> i love pretty, that story that's ingenious <laughs> i mean that is so ingenious but my my, step, my parents were just very close to the well, idea it's interesting what you know this what this doctor you know what he what he says that just it resonated with me when he said that you know so let's hear the rest of it now this the rest of it here is uh is also very interesting i think you guys enjoy it too so like learning who your true friends are and learning who your friendly associates are because you lose most of your friendly associates when you make a decision to go from a, a rational life to a creative <laughs> life. I once had a class, I gave a regular class at UCLA that was called uh, Keeping Your Spirits Up for Creative People. And one time there were a bunch of actresses in the class and I said, <laughs> at the beginning of the class, I said, let's go around the circle and everyone introduce himself and tell me, um, Tell me your name and where you're from, and uh, what is the worst question that you could be asked at a bar or a cocktail party in L.A., and, and how do you respond to it? And one, one lady said, you know, she was from Arkansas, and uh, her name was Joe, and the worst question that she had in L.A. was, when are you going to go back to Arkansas and work in the post office again? And I said, how do you answer that? That's terrible. And she goes, usually by bursting into tears and leaving the room. <laughs> I said, well, hopefully this class will find some help for that. The next woman said her name was Jenny, and she was uh, from California. And uh, she said, and the worst question I have is, what have you been in big lately that I've seen? And I said, yeah, that's like her answer. Too. She goes, and, and so what is your answer? And she goes, the Pacific Ocean. And I always love that because it, it showed that here's a creative person who has figured out how to protect her mind from the inevitable things that are going to happen in the big world. People are not born with sensitivity. They don't walk out of their homes on the way to a party going, I'm going to be particularly sensitive today. And the first thing they say to an actress they meet is, what have you been in big that I've seen? It's not because they're mean or that they're nasty people, but maybe they are but it's probably because they aren't being sensitive. And you having that answer instantly bonds you with them and makes them respect you. Okay, I'm gonna pause just a second here. How many times has one of you encountered that with strangers? When you say something, when you tell them that you're an artist, what do some of them say? What, you know, if you, if you don't mind sharing, what, what does, you know, the, the response or the response, you know, what kind of questions do they ask you? <laughs> they usually want to know what kind of art you do or uh, if you make money, that's the question you get. Okay. <laughs> Are you making a living doing that? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, the, the question that I, I've, I've, because uh, recently since I've come kind of like come out of the closet and I'm announcing to the world, you know, that I'm an artist. And when I encounter strangers, you know, that's, that's the question. So what, so you can make money doing that. That's usually what the, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's a negative. It's, it's actually a negative, you know, a negative it's, connotation to it. Yeah. Usually yeah. what somebody will ask me, well, they'll ask me, I'll say, well, I make jewelry, you know, and they'll say, well, there's their money in that. And I'll say, well, you know, yeah, I usually make uh, anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars extra a year from not making anything, you know. And if I, when I was selling regularly on the weekends at the farmers market, I was making anywhere from three hundred to a thousand dollars on the weekend. That's nothing to sneeze at. No, you know. <laughs> I wasn't making that make painting, but 
you know, but now it's. <clears throat> but the the point that I like his, his focus and what he, when he's talking about is how we as artists, how we can handle that. Now let me uh, continue, and you're you're hear what I'm talking about. And I mean, that's as much as a banker makes. It's it's so brilliant the way the way he turns this you know turns this around. So uh, yeah, or respecting yourself enough to not take their question seriously. You don't ever yeah. answer any question that somebody gives you unless you feel like it. Sure. So when she answers it that way, she disarms the whole situation, whereas the first girl is not doing such a good job because she shouldn't be going to parties until she can answer that question about going back to Arkansas and working for the post office. And, and that's a, another example of protecting your mind or not protecting your mind. Uh, and, and having the introspection to know how to deal. And, and you were talking about like whether people react, how do people react to your deciding to be creative? Now, I always say it, it's, it's like there's this guy down the street who's been painting in his garage for the last 10 years. You know, the neighbors are talking, they're talking about him as he's crazy. You know, he's a cat guy. He's been doing that for 20 years, whatever. And then one day they read in the paper that one of his paintings sold for a million dollars. And what do they what do they say? Now he's crazy. The guy was a genius. Yeah. <laughs> a genius to be working that hard. But everything suddenly changes when the world accepts your creativity. But the only way you're going to get to that point is if you absolutely control what you're doing and, and believe in it yourself. And even if you don't believe in it, keep acting as though you do. But you don't have to believe in things. You don't have to feel good in order to work. And you don't have to feel good in order to do good work. You can work. And normally when you work, you get rid of these feelings anyway. So this is all examples of dealing with the creative mind and how to get it to um, mm -hmm. be your friend as opposed to be something you're scared of and don't want to take off to a cabin in the woods. That is the best advice that I have ever heard, you know, for 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 an artist. He says, "Yeah, you know, don't be don't be afraid, you know." But he says, "Work, continue yeah. to work, because when you work, it these doubts of am, am I good enough? Is my art good enough? You know, I haven't sold a pain in a long time, or or are you get criticism." Um, yeah, you know, well, that what's that? That looks stupid, you know, whatever. Hey, you're your own well, worst critic. You don't need anybody else's yeah. opinion. I I just gotten where I don't ask people what they think of my work anymore. I just do it because I can tell whether I like a painting or not. You know, I'll show it to Will or I'll show it to you guys. I'll put it on the internet, but I don't usually ask anybody what they think of it, you know, and because I know whether it's good or not, you know. Um, well, the, the thing is, too, with being an artist, it's not, I mean, it's nice to make the money, but mm -hmm. that's not why we do this. And no. I mean, we would be doing it anyway, even if we didn't make any money. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely. In fact, uh, it's, it's a different um, we have thing this than just having a job. need <clears throat> to do this. You know, the money is... Is, would be nice. We were all in the Paul Klein's course, and one of the first things in his first monologue, he, that uh, the first meeting, he said that uh, as an artist, um, you can't help it. You will yeah. always create. If you're not doing it in a specific medium, it's going to be in another medium, but you right. cannot help yourself. No, you can't this burden and you have to do this why not try to make some money from it you know and so that's what yeah. you know, all this you know all this effort is about but he said people still continue to do this until we die we will continue you know, cre you know creating the art and everything and uh, that well, reminds the thing, is, the thing is that it's not um a job it's like it's not a nine to five job it's a way of life it's, you know, it goes deeper than just a nine to five job does. Yeah. Absolutely. Just... The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. 
participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Brosnan and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronzan at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you'd like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. That's cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons License 2019. Thank you for listening.